Uh, thank you, welcome. Uh, my name is Jared Jordan. I work for Netflix. Uh, I'm an engineering or software engineering manager. Uh, most, uh, my team is most famously for uh, built the video across all of Netflix when you play. So we did a bunch of tests across that that allow you guys to see that big hero image when you net land on Netflix and so you guys want to engage. Um, so that's what my team is. Uh, we have a stunning panel with some stunning colleagues here. Uh, Marvin, Tara. Oh, you're gonna clap? Oh, one clap? No, two claps? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Steven and Paul. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how we're going to do this is we're just going to break this up and have a, I'll ask a couple of questions, a bunch of questions about them so you guys can get to know them. Um, and then we'll leave, save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for you guys to ask some questions. If you guys ask something super uncomfortable, I'm going to say, see me afterwards. <laughs> Never good when the teacher says that, right? So that's great. Um, so we'll, we'll start out, uh, Marvin, uh, can you talk to us about how you got to Netflix? Oh, first of all. Can you hear me? Yes, no, yes, yes, yes. Yes, just recording. Oh, uh, yeah, we don't have it. Come on, bro. <laughs> Keep it going. Uh, so my name's Marvin. Uh, uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix. My team is called the Multi Device Experience Team. Uh, we work on basically uh, second screen experiences. What does that mean? Is if you ever use a Chromecast, and you want to cast an experience on a Chromecast, use your phone, press a button, you're watching TV on a big screen. Now also, uh, uh, we also have the same experience for actual TVs. So if you actually do the same thing on a regular TV, game console, or another set top box, then that's the team that we actually, well, my team is the one that handles that experience. Uh, the question, how to get to Netflix? Yes. To be honest, I was just recruited. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I grew up in Seattle. Uh, before that, I was working at Microsoft for Bing at the time. Prior to that, I was at school. And prior to that, I was interning at Microsoft as a high school intern. Um, so how I got to Netflix, it was just through a, a friend of a friend. And a headhunter kind of found me and really pushed me to join Netflix. At the time, Netflix was really big on they only hire senior engineers. And at the time, I think I had like three years practical industry experience. But I was really specializing in what I did. And, and what Netflix needed at the time was an, an expert in this particular area. And they were having trouble hiring people like me at the time in the Bay Area. So uh, I got recruited, uh, came in. I really didn't think I was going to get the job because I just got tired of interviewing. I was interviewing Google, Amazon, and so forth. And when I actually interviewed, I really thought I wasn't going to make it. So I, I went in with a, with a mentality of, uh, excuse my language, effort, you know. So. <laughs> Uh, so I walked in there, and lo and behold, I, I did well, and the offer came. And that's how I got to Netflix. And how long have you been at Netflix? So I've been at Netflix a total of eight years. Uh, oh, that's not that bad. <laughs> uh, I mean, to me, like eight years is, yeah, sure, eight years. I've been up for eight years. A couple other things we can mention is all of us are part of Dev Color. Yeah. Uh, so if you guys don't know what that organization is, uh, it's a software engineering organization. Tira, right here, here she's representing the org. Uh, and they just started a chapter in Atlanta. So if you're interested in learning about it, you know, that's a good thing. Cool. cool. Uh, Tara, you want to talk about your experience and how you got to Netflix? Sure. Um, so before Netflix, I actually worked at Disney in Seattle, not from Seattle, but I was living in Seattle for some time. Um, and before that, I actually worked at Amazon for about seven years. And before that, I was on the East Coast. So it's kind of serendipity how I ended up on the West Coast. And kind of similar to your experience, um, I ended up at Netflix kind of through recruiting, but more towards personal recruiting. Um, my director, who I work for now, had actually worked with me at Disney. Um, long enough ago, we, I, I was a senior engineer, and he was a tech lead. <laughs> so that's, that's how far back we kind of went. And so when he left to come to Netflix, he basically kept trying to recruit me to come to work as an engineer. And I was like, I'm not moving to California. I'm not moving to Silicon Valley. It's not happening. Um, and he spent about three and a half years, <laughs> like every six months, basically calling me. I'm like, how's it going? Ready to come to Netflix? <laughs> you know? And I was like, no. Um, 
And so this, like I said, went on for about three and a half years. And then eventually I said, look, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. How about I come down? We hang out over the weekend. I'll come to Netflix. I'll talk to whoever you want me to talk to. And then if I don't want to interview, this conversation is over. <laughs> like, we are never talking about Netflix again. It's been three years. Let it go. <laughs> um, but uh, I did, and I came down, and at the end of the week, and I was like, oh, God, I have to apply. I'm just not ready for this. <laughs> um, and so, like, two weeks later, I interviewed, and then two weeks later, I was hired. So. Uh, kind of crazy. Um, and I've been at Netflix now almost three years. So. Oh, I didn't say what I worked in. So I work in acquisition. So uh, specifically, my team handles the sign-up flow, registration, login, across every device, across the whole world. Um, and my specific group works on partnerships and payments. So we're the money. So <laughs> career advice, be the money. Always be the money. Yeah. Who, who here does not have a Netflix account? Yeah. Put your, hand, put your hand up if you don't have a Netflix account. Oh, see, see, go, go, go get them. Yeah, go get them. Wait, are you sharing? Are you sharing? It's okay. It's okay. Don't put it up short either. Put it all the way up so we can see. Oh, they, they are. That is true. That is true. He doesn't understand it. If I don't bring the money, though, he can't retain it. So, yeah. That's really dope. Steven. Hey. My name is uh, Steven Ojo. I'm the manager on the uh, iOS platform. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Manager on the uh, iOS platform team, and uh, our team's specialty is uh, streaming and logging. So, on the Apple TV or the iPhone, once you press the play button, it's our stack that's responsible for a great playback experience. Um, I came to Netflix uh, a year ago next week from another uh, streaming startup, a uh, very similar product but was ad-driven, and got to a point after about two years there where I just decided to reach out and see what I could find. Um, then I went in my inbox and I actually had a message from one of our recruiters. Uh, so we started talking, I gave him an interview, and then I ended up getting a job. Um, how did I get to Netflix? Yeah. Um, let's see, how did I get to the place before Netflix? Uh, came to Silicon. Oh. <laughs> Tell your story, man. Tell the story, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to make sure it's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, just go, go. Another common theme is where I guess we've all lived in Seattle too, in yeah. uh, work. No, Paul. And Paul and Microsoft mostly, except for you, or Apple and Amazon. <laughs> Amazon, sorry. So my name is Paul. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, originally from Nigeria, grew up there, and then moved to the U.S. for college. Uh, prior to Netflix, I was at Microsoft for 11 years. And no, I stayed there too long. Um, but I moved around at Microsoft. So I worked on Bing for five years, worked on Xbox for three years, worked on Windows, and then eventually came to Netflix. And how did I get to Netflix? So I'll credit being at Netflix on two things. It was a relentless recruiter, or a relentless Snapchat recruiter, and, and network. So what I mean by relentless Snapchat recruiter is that I'd been at Microsoft 11 years, was happy there, working on stuff that was meaningful to me, and I felt like I had an impact. But then a Snapchat recruiter reached out to me, and said, hey, you know what, I would love to have you at Snapchat, and I just ignored him. You know, I got the email, I ignored him, and the next thing you know, he's calling me, I ignored him, and this happened for about six months. So eventually, I'm like, what does this guy want? <laughs> so I talked to him, and he's like, oh, you know what, like, I will fly you to L.A. My wife was pregnant at the time, too. And she's like, oh, yeah, we'll fly her to L.A. to you can spend time, like, at our office. You can talk to a few people, see if you like, like it out here, and then we can talk more about the interview process and all that. So my wife and I went to L.A. The office is on the beach. It's on Venice Beach. So we're like, oh, this is like vacation, retirement spot. Like, this, we should move here, right? <laughs> So um, I interviewed a Snapchat, got the offer, but while I was interviewing, I thought, okay, I've been at Microsoft so long, if I'm going to interview, I might as well interview at other places too. And that's how Netflix came into the picture. One of my good friends from Microsoft left Microsoft and went to Netflix. Um, and then I said, okay, you know what, I'm going to do Netflix. 
Amazon, I live downtown Seattle. Amazon office was four blocks from my apartment, so I decided to, to interview there too. Uh, um, luckily, I got offers from all three, but Netflix stood out to me because of the, the unique culture. Um, and you know, at Microsoft is a very big company. I have a set of cultural values written down, but I didn't know how to live it. It was just so big. And at Netflix, it was intriguing to read about the culture. This was when they, we, uh, Netflix had the 127-page culture deck. Uh, now it's a lot better. It's just four pages of scrolling now. Uh, <laughs> back then, I read all 127 pages, and I thought, wow, is this for real? Like, like do people actually behave this way? Um, but when I interviewed, and I, like, just from the conversations I had, and from my friend that was there, the way he described it, I'm like, okay, you know what, this is, this is like too good to be true, and people are confirming it, so let me go check it out. That's how I decided to That's a great call out. If you haven't read the Netflix Culture Deck, I, it's, a, I guess, only a four page scroll now. Uh, you should, I mean, it's a brilliant read about, you know, context over not control, um, and, but really principled on how Netflix makes decisions uh, from, the, from the bottom to the top. Every team is a little bit different, but overall, there are some strong themes on how the Netflix just operates. So that's really good. Uh, Go ahead. Another one as well. Um, we had a chance also to read the 120 context of the Bible as well. There's a lot of context on there uh, that was given some historical background as to how Netflix is about the way that our culture is done. Um, yeah. If you can, read that as well. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. How can we find this? Just Google it. Actually, the memo is, is on the job. Job's going to be on Culture deck, Netflix culture yeah. deck, yeah. the top hit. <laughs> so, uh, one interesting thing also is we're all, or the majority of us are leaders, but we're all leaders or people leaders. Uh, Marvin is uh, a leader on IC or individual contributor. Paul transitioned from IC to become a leader uh, about two years ago at Netflix. Uh, many years at, at Microsoft. Uh, so can you guys talk to us about uh, generally how leading is different at Netflix or leading individual projects is different at Netflix as I see? Um, so while I was at Microsoft, I spent about half my time as an IC and half my time as a manager. So I was a manager my last five years there before coming to Netflix. And at Netflix, I've also been an IC and a manager. So what's different about being a manager at Netflix is I think one of the big things that is different is um, less hands-on from a technical perspective I don't hold at Netflix because my team is very senior. Uh, at Microsoft, I have a mix of very junior engineers and some senior engineers, so I still have to be very hands-on with the junior engineers. At Netflix, I don't have to be hands-on at all because all the folks on my team have 10 plus years of experience. I really can't tell them exactly. They know what to do. But what I then try to do is I focus more on giving them context on why we were doing what we were doing. Obviously, what we were doing and then why we were doing it, and then they can go around it. So that's the big thing. It's just I can be more hands off, I can focus more on strategy, and let the team handle the implementation and execution. The other big thing I've about managing at Netflix is, so there's, Netflix is very flat, right? So compared to Microsoft where it's, there are multiple levels of hierarchy. So the way information flows at Netflix is very seamless. Like I can talk, to, I have access to my ED, I have access to my CEO, and I can get great context. At Microsoft, there's a trickle down effect. So by the time it gets to you, uh, a lot of things get lost in translation. Uh, so at Netflix, I feel like my job is a little bit easier because I have the unadulterated uh, context that I can get. Those are the main uh, differences uh, just from managing as a resource. Yeah, Marvin, you want to uh, so kind of following up to what Paul said. Uh, Order of back. 
Go managing ahead. a Netflix is very different because, like, like you said, all of our team members are very experienced. So your whole focus is less on leading them technically versus just giving them context and understanding of what the goals are and knowing that they'll make a lot of the right decisions. Um, it's, a, it's, it's about having a lot of trust in your team and they do a great job because here we focus on just, again, big picture, the goals, and they'll come up with projects on their own, things that need to be determined, they'll figure that out, and it's just your job to make sure that they're solving the right problems. I can add one to that. But I will say, just as an anecdote, my first four months at Netflix, um, I literally spent every day going, I don't know what my job is, <laughs> because no one in my team needs me to do anything for them, <laughs> but tell them what the next project is. And I was like, oh God, what am I doing here? Right, surprise, surprise, I'm not a manager. Um, uh, but uh, in my particular role at Bill Ford, not Ford, I should say, I do find myself in a lot of leadership opportunities. And uh, the big difference between being a manager and FSB and IC is that most managers spend a lot of their time in meetings. So they do a lot of context uh, sharing, send the context, just so that the people working under them have the proper, um, how do I say, the proper direction as to, as to what they need to do on a day-to-day. -day. So for me and my team, uh, my team, uh, my manager's actually here, um, Kevin. Uh, I was gonna <laughs> fix that answer. <laughs> fix that answer now. I had to, I had to, I had to, I had to time for that one. Um, You're supposed to be candid. I'm being candid. <laughs> it's the culture. I'm telling you, like, all right, so, so for me, like, I'm in charge of, typically, like, my role is, like, you have a project and you own that whole project full stack, right? So sometimes, not sometimes, oftentimes you're required to basically um, drive that project to completion. And it's up to you to basically set the context and inform the people you need, you need to work with in order for you to drive that project. If you need any, any help, any context, or any type of, uh, any type of uh, help leading your own project, um, you reach out to your manager. So a good example is, let's say for instance, actually, an analogy I like to use is a manager's job for me is I have a problem, I'll let you know the problem. Your job is to pull out the cannonball or the cannon, put the cannonball in the cannon, I point at the problem, you light the fuse, you tell me my obstacles are actually clear so I can actually go ahead and do what I need to do. Um, but from a leadership standpoint, it's, I don't know, it's kind of, it's interesting. I mean, I have to think about this a little bit more deeply, but it's, I've, I've done so many different projects and led in different ways. Sometimes my leadership is, is it being a good role model, a good influencer. Uh, sometimes my, I spend a lot of my time actually mentoring people who actually come to the company who don't understand the culture, who don't have a firm grasp of the culture, who don't, um, who don't understand that there's a nuance to actually working in Netflix and, and understanding the culture as fast as possible in order for you to be successful as fast as possible. Um, that's also part of leadership as well. And so my experience gives me that. Um, sometimes managing up for sure. Um, uh, giving my manager the proper context, my VP the proper context, my director the proper context, and oftentimes even my CPO the proper context, whether it's things around diversity, inclusion, or just things that I care about. Um, or even like, for instance, um, we have this process at NAP that's called 360s. And you have an opportunity to really give anybody in the company feedback, right? And and that feedback is typically candor, direct, and if someone's not doing something and you want something changed, this is your opportunity to actually say something. And it takes a lot of courage to step up to, let's say, a director or a VP and tell them you're wrong in this decision. And it takes a certain level of leadership to really say, I think you should go this way. And, and uh, a good example is that I was telling my VP, like, hey, um, our org is not inclusive enough. It's not diverse enough. I don't see enough of me. And I gave that feedback to my manager, then my director, and my VP. And uh, just having conversations around issues that, that you think uh, will make the business better and, and, and uh, will make your experience better at Netflix uh, has been a lot of ways I've been able to lead in my own way. Um, I'm being kind of long-winded because this is, uh, what, stop what? <laughs> Yeah, let me stop. Uh, no, you're doing great. You're doing great. Yeah. Cheers. 
all things about our culture that we love. Yeah. You're going to pass down the thing? We're very empowered. Right? So we have a lot of power to do things how we want to do it. So for example, hiring. Managers have each manager. So the way I hire for my team can be very different from how Stephen hires for his former team. And then same thing for Kyle. Like we can all be different if we think it is more valuable for our team to be different. Right? Or the way we make decisions around how our team is we have power to curate whatever we want because we think it's the right thing that our team is doing. Even when, when it comes to keeping people in power for our team, right? If I want a certain type of diversity, I'm empowered to be have that. So I can go higher from Atlanta, I can go higher from Nigeria, I can go higher from anywhere. If I feel that's what my team needs and that is part of the team So that empowerment is helps us be more successful than I think other places. So I'll do sort of numbers of things that I could do. I'll get an intern every scrum. I could just get that. Whether I liked it or not, I was getting an intern. Right. So um, or when it comes to diversity on our team, I had no control over what the people couldn't send to me or me. But in ethics, I have the power to control all of that. As long as I feel like that's the best thing for my team, then that's the best thing for us. I certainly agree. I think uh, I came from Evernote and I was leading uh, growth engineering over there. And I think the difference between Evernote and I also worked at Microsoft. Um, and I think the di difference is a lot of the, a lot of companies that I've been at as a manager, you are either uh, use the term meat shield, like right, I need to buffer all of the experiences so that I, I can just get the people to be focused. But it, it's actually the opposite at Netflix. The people want as much information they have so they can make the right decision because they can filter out what the priority is. I may have to guide the ship a little bit. Like, right, so the so it doesn't run into the iceberg, mm -hmm. uh, but most of the time they're going to make the right decisions because we're hiring the most uh, people right for the job that they need, and I think that's that's something that was very unique about my job, and, and it's also very challenging, right? Like uh, Tara says, like what sometimes I'm like, ooh, what 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 do I do? Okay, I don't want to make up busy work. I want to do something that is impactful. So a lot of it is how do I work on the thing that's most impactful, and how do I free up my team to work on things that are most impactful? So that's great. Uh, one question that you kind of all touched on a little bit is, is, is diversity and inclusion. We're in Atlanta. It looks very different than uh, Silicon Valley. Um, um, a lot of us have moved uh, from uh, Seattle or from the East Coast or from places that don't look like the Silicon Valley. Uh, can you guys talk about that experience? Because all these folks probably are actually interested in, in, in that area and how it looks and how it feels and where do I get my hair cut and things like that. <laughs> So I, I I don't go to a barber. Uh, you know, you can. <laughs> Anymore, you had a bad experience. <laughs> There's actually a story behind that. Like I went to a barber for the first time when I moved to Seattle, and the barber shifted my hair, and I stopped. Go I never went to a barber after that. That's but, a cultural uh, mistake. You know our people. That's okay. Don't touch the line. <laughs> um, so just diversity and like, so our experience like with, with moving. So I went to Howard, um, HU, any HU people in the house? No? Oh, what up, All right. Um, and like, I, so Howard is in DC, very, DC is very cosmopolitan. So the way, Howard is majority black school, but like once you get out into DC, it's very cosmopolitan. Every, all around the world, people are uh, like people from all over the world are in DC. And then I moved to Seattle, so that was a shock for me just moving to Seattle because it's not as diverse as DC. And then Seattle, for in, in most parts, is very similar to Bay. Uh, maybe East Bay is a bit different because there are more people in East Bay. Um, so my experience was, I think, when I moved from Nigeria especially, because I grew up and I was born and raised there, coming to Howard, I felt like at home. So people, when people ask me, oh, did you go through any kind of culture shock? I did not, because 
Howard was filled with tons of black people from everywhere. So Africa, the Caribbean, and then African Americans. So I just felt at home. We didn't go through any kind of culture shock. But then I, my culture shock started when I started when I started at Microsoft in corporate America. It was where you know I think we've all gone through this to an extent where you're the only right. So I was the only person in my organization of over 500 people, right? And then that's when it started hitting me like, oh, you know what? I'm actually different. Like I'm actually around a lot of people that are not like me. And I think Silicon Valley is similar to that. I think with new movements around just uh, increased awareness on diversity. I think it's changing a little bit. Um, we're trying to get more people from outside the Silicon Valley to move to the Silicon Valley so we can change the demographic more. Um, and I hope through events like this, we create more awareness like taking on the more of us to get larger. Um, and so I hope Um, thank you. So yeah, Silicon, like you said, Silicon Valley is a little bit of a culture shock. I grew up in Los Angeles, then went to uh, college in Seattle. Uh, and then coming to Silicon Valley, it was a little bit different, like you said. Um, but the one thing that we'll say now is that there's a lot of energy and movement towards changing those demographics. And I think there's more of that in Silicon Valley than maybe anywhere else. People really are making an effort and taking inclusion seriously. Um, I'm very happy to be working with Netflix where it's a real company value and we actually execute on it. Like, we're here in front of all of you. Like, that's, I didn't have that happen when I was working at Apple, for example. Um, it's, it's very nice to be in Silicon Valley now where we're pushing to shift those demographics around and make a difference. So, don't be intimidated by the, you know, some of the culture shock you might experience. Just know that it, it's a place you could actually come to and make an impact and try and shift it. Uh, not to be a contrarian, even though I'm totally a contrarian. Um, I will say that I lived in Seattle for 14 years, and I feel like I met more black people in the Bay Area in the first six months than I did in the entire 14 years I lived in Seattle. So for me, I was like, woohoo! There's more black people! You know, and actually just more people in general. I mean, it's just a much more cosmopolitan um, area. Um, I do think, though, what was interesting for me, especially coming to Netflix, um, my first year, I was one of two black female software engineering managers, and it was this realization that in my 20-year career in tech, I had literally not met one other African-American female engineering manager, and how messed up that was, <laughs> you know? And um, she was there for a year, and then she left, and then I was the only one, <laughs> I was the only one in the company <laughs> for about two years, until about two weeks ago, and I was so happy. I was just like, woohoo! Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that is just, you know, just it's just the challenge of, I mean, I guess I don't have to get into the politics of that, but it is, it is really important to me at this stage of my career, especially to, like, how do I, um, how do I make sure that I'm not always the only person in that room? How do I, how do, where do we start? Do we start in middle school? Like, you know, what does that look like? don't really know. Um, I certainly didn't have a traditional background. I did not go to school for computer science. I am self-taught. Um, and so clearly I could do it, right? So uh, other black women can also do it. Um, but yeah, it, I also appreciate working in a place where I could literally say, uh, to your point, to my VP that like, you know, we were talking about, I think they had asked me to speak at a, um, at a women at event and I said, no, right? You know, I, I don't want to do it. Um, I had done something for strong black women. And I had a really great chat with him, but I basically was like, look, I, the solution to this problem is not to trot me out every time <laughs> there's a thing we want to do. The solution to this problem is to hire <laughs> people who look like me. And he was great. I mean, he totally took that feedback really well and was like, you know, let's continue working on this. And he's like, you're right. You know, I respect your decision not to participate in this particular thing. I was like, you know, a couple times a year, I'll do it. But I'm just saying, I don't, can't fall back on it as a crutch. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll co-sign everything we just said. Uh, I got nothing else to add about that. But I will say this, though. You guys have been slandering Seattle the whole time. Uh, it's not trash. 
No, 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 no. Me and Stop. me and Jared. Native, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're native, we're native. So, so I went to elementary, middle school, and high school in Seattle. So in both of our cases, we lived in the black bubble. Seattle had a real black bubble. Well, 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 what do you mean? I'm only telling you how life was for me. It's my story, not yours. <laughs> Preach! It's my story. We, we are close knit as a as a as a team and stuff, and we travel and joke with each other. Can I talk so. though? <laughs> no, you can't. Your time is up. Next. No. <laughs> no, no, please, please tell your story. No, no, no. It's not really a story. It's just more like a plug. Like Seattle, Seattle did have a black network, but everything they said is is, is cosign. I absolutely agree with with, with, with Marvin. I think it, it's it's funny we. Uh, when we met each other, we were just going around the people we knew. I'm like, oh, I know this person, I know this person, I know this person. And he's like, oh, I went to school here. And I was like, oh, really? My sister went to school there. And he's like, oh, I know your sister. I was like, oh, that's oh. weird. We never, no, no, he didn't know my sister. <laughs> <laughs> nah, no. <laughs> nah, no, it was funny. No, 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 but, but it was just like, the, the community is so close and actually Seattle is like, yes, it is hard to find that. And I think that's part of my story is, is, is also Tia, like she knew my cousin and was like, we, we never even met when we were in Seattle. We actually worked at Microsoft also together and never, never met, it was funny. Um, but I think uh, my, my story is probably similar to yours is like when you go to college, I think that's when you start learning to code switch yep. um, and start learning to, to move through that. I think it's it, the Silicon Valley reinforces that because it is so different than uh, a lot of other areas. And I think uh, just like where you send your kids or where you think about things like this or, or, or how many places that you go get hair products. Well, I don't have any hair either, Paul, to either more, <laughs> but, but or beer, beer products or whatever. Um, <laughs> and so all of those things that you have to, beer, beer? did I say beard? Yeah, beard. Good. beard. <laughs> okay, that's good. So I am waiting for later. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's similar to every experience is like as soon as you have to start being less or, or dampening who you are, I think I think uh, that's when you, you start thinking about that. But I, I do think that there's this sense of overwhelming urgency now in the Silicon Valley for that to change. I mean, you, you see all these companies that they're talking about it and being open about and transparent about their numbers and how they feel. So it's very, very, very important. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. I, the last question we were gonna ask here is uh, can you, to give, in, leaving some advice for all these folks like, what is uh, one advice you would give to each one of these folks as their career for as, or, or something that you learned in your career? All right. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I can go a couple ways, but um, my advice to you is, like, be true to yourself. Um, this industry can be tough, and, and especially for a person of color, and especially if you feel like you're the only person in, in that space. But uh, try hard not to lose yourself. I say that because there was a time where I lost myself. And there was a time where I found it hard to really communicate what I wanted. And I found myself just going through the motions. Um, but my career really took off when I found my own voice and was able to really speak my own experience to my management chain, to my peers, and really inform people what my experience is like so they can be aware that, hey, look, I, I'm a talented software engineer, but also have a particular bent that I bring to the company or bring to this industry that is not actually uh, being, being recognized. So the more true to yourself you are and the more you find the courage to speak that truth, um, you'll find a lot of allies that you may not think you had before. So, so yeah. Wow, I wish I had prepared something. Uh, ahead of time. Um, I guess really the big, the big, uh, the big takeaway is I would definitely stress the value of building, um, you know, a network. And I would say building one that's, you know, not necessarily based on what you or I can do for each other, but really, you know, based on like shared respect. Um, because, you know, I've, at the beginning of my career, and I think in the beginning of everyone's career, you know, you got your resume and you're kind of working off of like, you know, that sort of thing. But as time moves on, you really start kind of working off of your reputation. Um, 
and I don't think I've applied for a job in a decade or so. I mean, I think it's basically been someone I knew or someone who knew someone I knew who said, hey, you know, I'm reaching out for this particular thing. And I mean, it takes a long time to build these sorts of relationships. You know, there are people, when I work at Amazon, you know, um, you know, from 2002 that we're, we're still in touch with each other and we're still trying to help each other. And so, um, I really always try to stress on that, like, you know, make connections with people, build support systems, build your network, take it seriously, give back, um, because it will help you as you're trying to traverse more challenging places. So uh, something I want to impart to everybody is to uh, always try. Don't be intimidated to apply to a company. Uh, there are some people, sometimes, myself in the past, I look at a role and be like, oh, there's no way they're going to hire me, and I wouldn't apply. That's not true. Apply. Go for it. The worst thing they're going to do is say no, and you might get some feedback as to why you were told no and do better next time. Um, or you could apply again, and you'll get that offer. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is, kind of following your point, the importance of networking. You got to, if you come to a conference like this, you should leave, you know, knowing five new people adding them on LinkedIn, getting to know people, because um, things like this pay dividends later. You know, someone might not be looking for a job to hire you tomorrow, but in three years, once they've been promoted to manager or whatnot, if they remember meeting you, they might reach out to you first in their network. So all I can say is stress, network, 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 and just apply. Go for it. That's how I got here. So. <laughs> say is um, always keep growth in mind. So always push yourself to grow. It's scary for some people. Like A lot of it comes with change. Sometimes you might have to change whatever you're doing in order to grow. But if you always think to yourself, hey, whatever I'm doing now, what is the next thing for me? Like, What does growth look like? It forces you to really think through okay, what, what new thing do I need to go learn? Or what new thing could I, or what current skill do I need to get better at? So growth is something that I think has driven me in my career to where I am today. And even till today, I still always ask myself, okay, what is that next thing? How can I grow? Whether it's in work or in life, right? So in life, there are things that you can push yourself to grow at. And both are usually interconnected. As you grow in life, you probably grow in your career. Uh, but just always push yourself to grow. And leverage people around you. So a lot of what you said, right? Leverage your network to grow. Uh, embrace change or don't be scared about taking that next step. That's how you're going to grow. It's very scary. Like I, I suck at interviewing too. I think we're talking about interviewing. I suck at it, but I embraced it. I learned how to interview and then I interviewed. But on the other side of it, there's a lot of growth. Right? Now I feel like I've done a lot of things that if I'd say that Microsoft made me, as much right and then maybe at some point in the future there'll be something else for me after netflix and that will also be growth right so just embrace growth and always push yourself to grow. i have two pieces of feedback or two pieces of advice one is is, is feedback like be uh quick in, at learning and being able to discern um, the advice and some feedback, even if it's constructive feedback. The faster you can, the, it'll help you grow. The second part of that is, is, is find a place, job, or role where you can do your best work and be comfortable with who you are. And, and then if you're not there today, go there quickly because you will grow that much faster. Okay. Uh, we'll open up to questions. We have about uh, two minutes, eight minutes. Any questions? Who are you? Um, Stand up. Tell us. What about? <laughs> My name is Gustav, and, um, and I, I, I like I like what Netflix is doing, like the, the, the diversity and inclusion. Because I'm from Rwanda, so uh, when it comes to technology, there's nothing, nothing like that in, uh, in my country. And I would like to do a plug for Black Earth Rising. That was a really good show. So 
but to you, Ms. Tara, because I'm, I'm also I'm, I'm self-taught, I, I got a, I got a degree in uh, political science, but I love technology, and I wanted to see how I can be able to impact back home. So when you do, when you when you when you move to, towards the side of uh, self-teaching, what are the, what are the tools that you that you use, and what kind of like helped you keep going? Because it's a it's a very it's not like a like a like a particular pace in like four years, I'm done. Mm -hmm. One of those, like you have to keep grinding. Yeah. So how did you, how did you end up? Uh, oddly enough, uh, I also was political science, international studies in German, so I went to school to be foreign policy, so it's good that I work in tech. Yeah. 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 Totally makes complete sense. Okay. Um, um, you know, I feel like in some ways I was pretty lucky. You know, I, my first tech job was in 1997. So nobody knew what the internet was, right? We were all starting basically from scratch, even though, you know, um, there was stuff out there. It just kind of was exploding. So I think the pressure to have a CS degree was a little less because it wasn't going to help you, right? <laughs> like you weren't learning HTML and JavaScript. Oh, JavaScript actually wasn't even there. wasn't even there then, right? You weren't learning that, like you know, in CS programs. So um, it kind of put me in a little bit of ways on equal footing because we were all just rapidly trying to, to, to do stuff. Um, I definitely feel like it's harder now just because if you look, I don't know if you're front end or back end dev, but like, oh, the proliferation of JavaScript. <laughs> like, it's just like, stop already, you know? Like, um, but I think for me, you know, a part of it was basically just trying to read everything I could um, and, and also trying to build, like I'm definitely one of those perfect, perfect people who have to like build something to make it stick. Um, I was also incredibly fortunate that I ended up, my first two tech roles, I ended up in companies where I had people in positions of power who absolutely invested in growing me um, and gave me opportunities to, um, to work on things that I probably wasn't quite qualified for, but they're like, she's smart, figure it out, somebody help her. Like, you know, um, and I did a lot of work out of work, right? Because I couldn't fall back on like this kind of four-year foundation. So um, I really think if I were trying to you know, start now, I probably would reach out to someone who I felt like, okay, I kind of look at you as like an expert in this field. You know, what do you think are kind of like the core things I need to work on? And then I would focus on that. And then yeah, I would build some of those things. I would definitely go, are you here? Are you local yeah, too? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I would go to meetups. I mean, I don't know what the scene is like here, but I know in Seattle, I used to go to a lot of like JavaScript meetups just because it was just another way to get exposed to things. You know, you know, Disney, is, you know, at least for what we were doing, was not the most like innovative. So I would go to these other spaces to just be around people and learn about like, what's that thing, and then I'd go home and read about that thing. Um, it's a little bit of a grind, and it's hard when you start, but once you even get like one year of ex professional experience like it becomes way easier. The hardest part is getting that first year, getting someone to take a chance, you know, start small, 15 man company my first year, but you know, now I'm at Netflix, so just start, just build up. We can talk more after this. Yeah. Yeah. So you should talk about getting experience. Don't wait to get an official job. Pick a problem that you want to solve and build something for that problem. So it could be a problem in Rwanda, yeah, maybe there's a solution there. Yeah. Right. Apply that solution to solve that problem in Rwanda. And now all of a sudden you have experience. You can write something on your resume. Like, I solved this problem in Rwanda. So don't wait for an official job. You can start doing stuff now that will help you get that Hi, I'm Yvonne. Nice to meet you guys. I saw most of you here speaking to us. But a uh, question I had is a question that I kind of struggle with a lot. And I do, I hear, like, I've also spoke to, like, many people at other conferences, well, not many, just a few, um, Jim and Ryan, um, about, like, the fact that, you know, at Netflix they have a lot of senior developers, um, not many, like, junior or anything like that, because what I was t told, like, you guys working on really important stuff, really advanced stuff. But uh, one thing I, I struggle with is, like, if you're, at that middle ground area as a developer in your career, and you want to move up to like more senior, um, but you don't really have good mentors, like people at Netflix or something that's doing more advanced stuff that you kind of want to get into. Um, how do you feel just having mostly seniors 
is contributing to like you're not really bringing up anybody kind of like to fill the shoes of the next level you're just kind of in that we all seniors we know what we're doing kind of route but you don't really have that 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 um experience now building up someone it's like oh, okay they can use this they need me right now they're in this career where they are great right here but they need to get here but they don't have that type of help from people doing more advanced more um cutting-edge technology or work. I have thoughts on that. One thing I could say is uh, networking. Networking, that's a, a really great, a great way that we try and build people up. You meet people that are, that are, in, that are in different stages of their career and, get, and through talking to them, you can give them advice and insight and eventually they can, they can apply that and, uh, Eventually, make those steps that you're referring to. Everybody. Now, I, I got it. I got it. I'm going to go fast. I'm going to go real fast. I'm going to go real fast. We, we, we've got, we've got one minute. Let's make this it. We've got one minute. Uh, so, so shh, we've got one minute. So, let, 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 let Tara do it. And then you go ahead. And then afterwards, if you guys have more questions, we can just come up and just chat with us. I will just say two quick things. I don't think traditionally Netflix has been a place that's your first job. I mean, that's just kind of pragmatic. Like, if this is a place that you come to, maybe mid-career or up. You don't need 10 years of school, for example, which Marvin can kind of speak to, you, depending on your skill set. But um, I do think there are a lot of other opportunities to kind of get that space or to get that experience. I would also say that, I mean, we're sitting here now because we, we value actually bringing people up. And so however we can be a part of these organizations, however we can do mentoring, outside of work to kind of lay the groundwork so that in two or three years someone's ready. Like, like we're absolutely invested in doing that. I feel like if I brought someone, especially on my team, um, into Netflix right now who wasn't quite ready and the pace with which we move, like they would not be set up for success. And I would hate for that to happen. So I'm gonna get you as ready as I can kind of off the books so that when we're ready, yeah, you can come in. Does that help? Cool. Was it? On the time? You got zero seconds. <laughs> thank, thank you guys all. I appreciate it.